The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians to their government. We're so pleased to have Delegate Charles Poindexter with us this morning. Welcome, sir. Well, it's good to be with you this morning, Woody. I think you've been here since, uh, what, 2007 and previous... 2000, 2008 was my first session. Yeah, and you had served, what, eight years on the Franklin County Board of Supervisors? I had that prior, so I had the local government experience, but my professional career uh, dealt with the federal government, so, uh, you know, I sort of closed the loop when I came to Richmond, local, see, state, and federal. That's great, because that brings a wealth of experience here. There's no question about that. And it is. In every functional area we work, it has a relationship to the federal government, and, of course, I'm on the Cities, Towns, and Counties Committee, and that's the interface between Richmond uh, uh, state government and local governments. Great. So towns, counties, cities. And, of course, you serve on the very important uh, Appropriations Committee. So let's talk a little bit about the budget and how, from your perspective, things are going so far. We have, uh, we have passed crossover day, so we're about halfway through. So from your perspective, right. tell us how things are going. Okay. Well, the budget is a big item. This is a short session. It was originally set up just to address the budget, and over time it morphed into a full session in less time. <laughs> More to do in less time. <laughs> but here, here was the situation we faced. We faced a $1.5 billion shortfall, and um, that just means the money wasn't coming in. Okay. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but that's not really the subject. What did we do with the problem we had? Okay. So we first set our priorities. Okay, what is it we really want to accomplish in the budget this year? And there were two or three major problems and, and thrust priorities that we set. Um, there's a, t a very terrible situation in the state workforce, the Virginia mm -hmm. State Police, the Capitol Police, uh, and our local police departments, okay? And we knew we had to address that. We uh, have mental health issues in the Commonwealth, and we had to put some more money in that. We knew that. Uh, and, and then there were some targeted areas. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we helped education, K-12 education, to at least uh, what was proposed in the budget. And we wanted to make sure that our higher institutions of learning were taken care of. And those were sort of the priorities that we set. So here's, uh, and for our audience, here's how it kind of works. <clears throat> we went through, and to find the money to fund those priorities, we looked at new spending that was in the budget. Mm -hmm. And we basically erased most of it. There might be one or two left, but very little new spending. And then we looked at the increases in the budget over the previous biennium. So when, we, when I'm talking about cuts, what I'm really talking about in most cases is a reduction in the increase that a given agency is getting or a different project is getting. So we went through that process and ferreted out enough money to address the priorities that I mentioned. Now, the uh, priorities obviously was the state workforce. Let me comment just a little about that. We're in a situation, and it's been coming for years, where we're falling behind in competing with the outside. 25, 27 percent below market value. That much? Yes, sir. Wow. Depending on the different areas in there, 25 to 27 percent. Uh, and then you had the situation of an aging workforce. Lots of our workforce mm -hmm. is near retirement. And when we hire people, we can't keep them for five years. So we're getting to the point where state services are, we can't deliver in many cases, especially in some of the targeted jobs, in some of the mental health institutions. Uh, there's a huge turnover in the state police, 48 uh, officers, sworn officers lost in November and December alone. So we gathered up this pot of money to address these specific problems and, and address raise. And we, we were proposing a 3% raise for the state workforce, not a bonus. Um, we're proposing um, to keep the retirement system contributions firm. Mm -hmm. And that's really necessary for our local governments as well as our state government to keep our bond ratings. Not only that, it's just right that we make sure that the current retirees get a check. Sure and that the people who are working for us now can be assured they, they will 
get a retirement check as well. Sure. So we, we obviously know that law enforcement is a critical function, public safety, mm -hmm. and we're losing uh, our, our state police. I take it to other jurisdictions, uh, including some of the localities within the Commonwealth, because they can pay more. Mm -hmm. That that's true. And in many cases, in some of your more wealthier suburbs, they, the right. pay is higher for a local deputy than for a state trooper. But we're losing troopers out of state. We had a few go to Texas. <laughs> to Texas, <laughs> I hear wow. one went to Oklahoma. And we've paid for the training. These are good troopers, and you know it's problematic whether we would get those back or if they go into another state. Uh, Merlin is uh, p pays quite well. DC, mm -hmm. of course, so there's some issues, especially for the Northern Virginia place like that. Uh, and but most people in uh, around the state are not too familiar with Capitol Police either. Right, they are not. So talk about them a little bit. Well, that's the oldest police force in Virginia. They guarded the Capitol back when Thomas Jefferson first sat in it in the first, that's what, 1796 when the Capitol grounds were first opened. So they provide the security here for the state government and the surrounding region and of course they pitch in and help jurisdictions here when they have need for, for support. Now they were in the same, same situation. And another issue here was what we call compression. And that means when uh, we hire a new deputy or a new trooper, um, they, to hire them, you have to pay them more than troopers or deputies that have been in that job five years or 10 wow. years or something. So we also have what we call a compression raise in there that will go in and, and sort of up the steps, if you would. So there's really uh, more than one component to it. And you know, there's a 3%, but there's also the, the step the compression type thing. Uh, and, and that's true for uh, all of those law enforcement groups. And it was a lot of money in there. Okay. Now, this raise uh, contrasts markedly with uh, the governor's suggestion in his State of the Commonwealth for a one time bonus. Mm -hmm. Why is a raise? Uh, more significant than, than a bonus. Obviously, uh, it's something that's there beyond right. that one year, but are right. there any other reasons? Oh, absolutely. The, the raise carries on forever. The bonus is a one time for that year only. And for us to be competitive, we have to do the raises in the base salary. And there was some talk around from some about one or two percent, but we came up with the word meaningful, that it had to be mm -hmm. meaningful, mm -hmm. and that's how we came up with the three percent. Well, what about in terms of calculating retirement <laughs> benefits for those who are still on uh, an older plan, for example? What impact does a bonus versus a raise have on retirement benefits? Well, it has a more expensive uh, impact on a VRS for a raise than obviously the bonus. So again, that's one time. <clears throat> But um, you, you need to be putting more money in because as sure. time passes, you have inflation and so forth. So um, it, it's unfortunate that, that it has to happen that way. And that's sort of re related to what we're doing in K-12 education. Uh, we actually increased uh, over the governor's proposal K-12 education from, I think, around $400 uh, million to about 420, 425, something like that. And retirement is an issue there. The local uh, teachers, for example, are, are local employees, and um, their salary and VRS and benefits are shared. The state pays part, and the local governments pay part. So there is a fiscal impact on the local governments when uh, we raise salaries. Even if we provide the money, they have to pay a little more for retirement, and we have to pay some more for retirement. But but that works out. Um, it's we made a fundamental change last year when we. There's a pot of money from the lottery that had right. been directed where the school boards had to spend it in certain specific areas. We freed up about 29% of that money last year. That was well received with the superintendents and school boards. And many, I think all but 12 gave raises and step increases around the Commonwealth last year. So this year, we're up in that to 40% in the House budget. That means the local school board has a lot more discretion in where they can spend their money and they can use it for a raise, okay? They can use it to pay the additional VRS uh, payments. Uh, they can use it for something else specific there. So we address the, the K-12 part instead of, a, instead of a bonus in, in, in a permanent sort of way and by allowing the local governments to make their decision there. 
So, so talk to us a little bit more about the state retirement system. I know that the, the state has over the past few years gone away from a defined be benefit program to more of a 401k approach <coughs> or a hybrid. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of young people who are entering government now mm -hmm. who probably won't be with us uh, as long as uh, as others have been, there's, there's a lot more portability mm -hmm. uh, baked into the system now to assist those types of employees. Yes, and the, the, the employees are asking for that, and, and it's, it's a little more affordable to them and us, and it, actually, over time, depending on the investments, they could actually be have a higher retirement check. So the hybrid was the first step that we implemented two or three years ago. Um, this year, Chairman Jones carried a bill to set up an optional um, defined contribution plan, which would be very, very portable to address the issue that you just brought up. Now, last year, uh, Speaker Howell carried a bill himself to take a look at the mm -hmm. compensation package, and they've made a number of recommendations, and uh, we're trying to, it'll be a step-by-step, multi-year process to uh, get our pay and, and our retirement and you know, the whole compensation package, health benefits, into something that it should be and be competitive in the market so that we can hire good people to provide our services. So what about the rainy day fund? Have we had to use any of the monies from that rainy day <laughs> yes, fund? Yes, we used quite a bit of it. Uh, we didn't want to draw it down as much as we could because we have to think three years. We have a budget mm -hmm. for two years. We're going into the second year. Well, okay, we can draw it down for there, but then we have to pay back next right, year. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, God forbid, I mean, what happens if the economy goes south again? Then we still need a reserve in a rainy day fund. So we took a fair amount out. I think it's 400 and one year and maybe 600 million the other year. Well, wasn't there also a federal uh, contingency reserve fund that was created because of sequestration at one time? I don't remember. Okay. Don't remember that okay. fund. <clears throat> to what extent has sequestration uh, affected uh, the, uh, the the budget of the Commonwealth over the last five or six years? And do you anticipate uh, any changes given the new administration in Washington in that regard? Well, yes. Uh, part A of your question: there has been an impact, but the impact has also been, in in my judgment. Uh, also due to the fiscal policies uh, not related to DOD, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act has really resulted in a lot of short-time, uh, part-time jobs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a huge factor. And we don't know how many, because the federal do government doesn't collect the data as to how many are full of it. And then you have people who are working two or three, so three new jobs have been, in, three new part-time jobs, and, and people still don't have benefits and, and, that, and that kind of thing. And that's because of the hourly... Uh, the 29 right. hour, uh, 30 hour, 30 and over is now full time, time instead employee. of 40, which, right. had been, which had been traditional. Uh, what was part B of your question? Uh, part B was, do you uh, anticipate any relief, so to speak, with Absolutely, the new administration? Absolutely, I do. Uh, the new administration has made it uh, clear during, uh, both during the campaign and, and since uh, President Trump took office that he intends to reestablish the United States military. Uh, I know a little about that. I worked for the Department of Defense for about 32 years, and I see the signs. I mean, the number of ships, uh, we're flying 40, 50-year-old airplanes, the Navy's small, probably the smallest since before World War II. Um, the manpower and the services is down, uh, and they're worked, overworked. Uh, they're all on deployment all the time, so that results in family problems, being away from home for excessive amount of time. So. Very clear to me, we have to recapitalize the uh, Department of Defense. And of course, in the Commonwealth, we have the Pentagon. I think we have close to 600 uh, military installations. Uh, not only are those federal employees impacted, but you have people who are contractors who work for the Department oh, of Defense. Oh, huge, and, yes. huge impact. And, and even and on the government side, I remember uh, three or four years ago, we lost something like 1,400 high-ranking officers mm -hmm. and civilians out of the Department of the United States Air Force. Now, those people lived in Northern Virginia. They paid Virginia taxes. I mean, they were, they were uh, high-paid and very professional military people and civilians. Same thing happened to maybe a lesser degree in Hampton Roads. So it's a, the, any time the defense uh, the budget does shrink, uh, it's a huge impact on Virginia. But again, some of the uh, monetary, physical, fiscal, uh, 
tax and health care decisions, I think, made in Washington was also a major mm -hmm. contributor. Now, one thing people don't quite understand is why the federal government doesn't have to have a balanced budget, but the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia does, and most other states do. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? The short answer is that the Commonwealth of Virginia has a constitution that requires us to balance the budget. Um, the federal government does not have such a requirement, and so Congress can run them out if they want to, and we see $20 trillion in, in debt, and that's the tip of the iceberg. That's just in sort of the cash flow discretionary side of the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you add the uh, entitlement programs up over the next 30, 40, 50 years. Like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those programs. Those programs, it's, it's probably 80 or 100 trillion, not 20. That's really scary. Now, the, the <coughs> Commonwealth for years has been able to maintain what's known as a triple A bond rating. That's the highest rating from Wall Street, I believe. Why is, this, why is that so important? Because Virginia has to borrow money to build college buildings, okay? Mm -hmm. We own all these university buildings, and we maintain them, okay? And the state government buildings. So we, as a state, and then underneath us, our local governments need to have good bond ratings. The locals, when they want to build a new school, okay, or a new, or a new county office building, we, when we want to uh, do the college and universities, the health care centers, um, government buildings, i.e. this building, yes. <laughs> uh, which is, really needs replacing. Uh, so if without that bond rating, we have to borrow at much higher rates. And as it is, we, we are borrowing very effectively. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people need to understand that, that we don't borrow to operate with. When we say balanced budget, that means we're going to operate on what we are bringing in. We do the borrowing, the long-term capital uh, for the major projects. And the other point there is that a lot of that, most of it indeed, is what we call revenue sharing bonds, which means if we are born to build a student center or say a dormitory on a college campus, then the room charges, you know, right. that money comes to Richmond and we pay mm -hmm. the principal interest mm -hmm. and principal on it, okay? So we're, we're pretty frugal with our borrowing. We have a low uh, ratio that we work off of income versus amount of right. debt. And so we've kept that. And of course, with that AAA rating, the interest rates on those on that borrowing is very low. It is very low. It is very low. And then we get the benefit of using those facilities for 20, 50, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, while, the, while they're paid off. Now, what about institutions of higher learning in our community <clears throat> colleges? How are they faring uh, in, in the current budget negotiations? Actually, better than the uh, introduced budget by the, by the governor. Um, I forget the number. Maybe it's 20, 20 million, I think, 28 million, 18, somewhere in that range, somewhere in the range of $20 million of additional money going to our higher institutions. Uh, it, it has been some controversy over our higher education uh, you know, institutions this year especially as regards out-of-state students and where the money goes for that. See, they right. charge like twice as much tuition. Right. And um, we're looking right now is if, uh, if on, say, out-of-state students that uh, that extra money that they bring in from out-of-state students um, would, after they pay for the cost of the actual education, and mm -hmm. that, that extra uh, money would be dedicated to helping on the tuition or financial aid for in-state Virginia right. students, and uh, that's one of it. Out of state, uh, there are some considerations about geographical dispersion, whether uh, enough of our children are getting into certain, uh, like in my district, do I have a, a reasonable uh, number of uh, young men and women going to uh, UVA, William and Mary, George Mason, right. and so forth. And so that's another thing that I've looked at, and I've spoken with our several of our college presidents about that this year. Now, you chair a very uh, <clears throat> active subcommittee on, on appropriations. It, it deals with some big picture items like commerce, technology, <laughs> agriculture. <clears throat> what kinds of uh, issues have you been addressing there? Well, I chair the compensation and retirement, and that, that's the one we've been talking about, dealing with people's lives and pocketbooks and health care, and, and that's really tough because, you know, you're really dealing with people and making sure that they're okay. Right, right. <laughs> The Commerce Subcommittee is chaired by Dr. O'Bannon, and we cover uh, things like economic development, agriculture, uh, IT, 
Uh, it's cats and dogs, <laughs> <laughs> and it's as broad as it is deep. So uh, we've looked at a lot of things. Uh, I, I worked a lot this year on the agriculture part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor had proposed some reductions in some key agriculture areas, and, and I didn't think that was appropriate. So we're restoring the, uh, the uh, forest land reforestation uh, tax contribution that mm -hmm. Virginia, by law, is supposed to make, and we didn't for many years. So when you see tracts of land cut, we're, we're, we're doing the things necessary, working with the landowners, putting up some money to replant that and get it back into production and, and quality timber instead of less quality. And would you believe that old buzzard that just soars so wonderful around? And that's the turkey buzzard. He's a good guy. But we have uh, black vultures that have invaded Virginia. And they come in huge flocks, and if a cow uh, or is having a calf or, or a small lamb in a pasture, they just gather up and destroy them wow. and eat them. So uh, we're trying to restore some funds there because it will pull down federal money that will target those areas that are really badly affected by that. So there's been some things in agriculture there that I've been focusing on this year. I think uh, people don't understand how important uh, to the economy agriculture and forestry is to the Commonwealth. It, those, those industries produce quite a bit of revenue, do they not? Well, not just revenue. They are the, the number of jobs and activities around. Uh, agriculture and forestry is still the largest single industry in Virginia. The largest single industry. Still there. Okay. Okay. And uh, especially, we're exporting a lot of things in, out of the forestry area mm -hmm. uh, overseas, both finished uh, wood and, and logs and so forth. I sold a track of timber a couple of years ago, and, and it was a very good track. I, a lot of my logs actually went overseas, shipped all the way to the Port of Virginia. Wow. <laughs> That's another uh, huge economic driver, the, the Port of Virginia, and, and I know there have been, there's been investments made by the Commonwealth at the port. And they seem the they're years. working out. John Reinhardt's doing a tremendous job getting it. He's gotten the port back and going. We're making some money, and uh, we're looking at a lot more volume going in and out of the port, especially as the super ships, uh, super tanker ships come along. And I've been working on that. Uh, the port's been very supportive, for example, of my efforts to finish Route 58 between mm -hmm. Stewart and Patrick County and 7781, I-7781 intersection. That's a whole nother four lane uh, that would take traffic off 64 and 81 and get it far west to uh, so that goods coming in can go further inland and our things out there can get to the Port of Virginia. So it's, it's a win-win and it can, it's very important that What's that there? And a, and a commonwealth. This sure. is one of those that, that, that everybody wins. Now, I, I know there are some study commissions you, you have, you, you, you're trying to initiate uh, through some legislation. A couple. Talk to us about one was very local, and it deals with these invasive mussels. Uh, they're called zebra mussels and quagra mussels, and they actually stopped all the pipes up, up in, the, new, in uh, the Great Lakes area. Oh, wow. And they get in and they attach to boats and uh, it's like you can't get rid of them. So I did ask uh, DGIF to do a study and see where are we, what, is, what can we do about it, uh, is there anything we can do about it, whatever. Um, now, I have to say this, that study would have cost money. Mm -hmm. So, no, I couldn't get that either, <laughs> even on appropriation. Right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but the Department of Game and Under Fisheries is going to come up Smith Mountain Lake, and uh, we'll have a town hall type meeting up there and explain where we are. They've actually been doing more than uh, many people are aware in, in invasive species, and very, I think, very much up on uh, why we really don't have them in Virginia and sort of North Carolina, right. South Carolina. Right. Uh, there's probably some conditions in the water that apparently at this point would tend to indicate that we might have some local infestations, but maybe we don't have the big problem that some people sure. think we could have. Sure. <clears throat> the other is an issue that um, goes back to my career in DOD when we had the situation of, say, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and, and, and the intelligence agencies couldn't exchange information. Now, if you go over to Bon Sures de Mar and they do a treatment on you and you, then you come out to visit me on Smith Mountain Lake and you have to go to Korea and the Lewis Gale while you're out there, we can't send that data electronically mm -hmm. from down here to where you need to be treated. So um, I suggested, proposed a study 
that would either be done by the Secretary of Technology or Dr. Hazel over in Health mm -hmm. and Human Resources. And that too would have taken money. But um, the Secretary of Technology uh, and I and Dr. Hazel agreed that that effort really uh, should be done in um, DHR. And Dr. Hazel and his people are looking at that issue already. So I may come back with something next year, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly, uh, um, I think, heightened the awareness that that's an area that we really need to do across the state, and I'm looking for a statewide solution. What we have is each hospital has hired a different contractor to implement their computer system, and they don't talk to each other. They're all stovepipes sticking straight up in the air, mm -hmm. and we need the smoke to go to between the pipes. Absolutely. <laughs> if I can absolutely, use that comparison. Absolutely. <laughs> Talk to us about judges. I know you have some legislation dealing with, with judges. Oh, don't ever get into judges in Richmond. <laughs> 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 no, it's very, very important. But I, um, I have um, my district uh, encompasses parts or all of two different uh, jurisdictions mm. in the court system in Virginia, the 21st and the 22nd. And if you recall, three, or four, three years ago, uh, we did a big study that said, okay, uh, how many judges, do, uh, what kind of cases are being held where, and how many judges do you need, and all that kind of, how do we distribute our judges? And it, it, a study like that, and, and it's a hard question to answer because there's really no answer. I have some courts that do probably 95% criminal work where mm -hmm. a court in Richmond might do 95% civil work. I see. A criminal trial can take days and days and days and days. A civil trial probably a half a day. So it's hard to figure, and there's no hard and fast rule. So my, the judges in my two districts uh, came to me and said, uh, how we think we could do with one less over here, mm -hmm. and we need one more over here. And uh, so I try to be able to do that, and what I found out was that uh, some people in the court system were, were trying to update the system, okay, this year. So we should have an answer as to whether the allocation is as we want it to be and are proposing to be in my bill. So the bill's stable, but we'll, as, as the results of that comes back, then I'll, you know, I'll do something with it next year. I know you have one, one other bill uh, deals with local government revenues and expenditures. We've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. comes out of the Petersburg effort where the uh, city of Petersburg uh, is in financial mm -hmm. chaos mm -hmm. okay, and, and trouble. And uh, what this bill will do will be require that uh, the mayor of any local town, city, or if it's a county, Chair of the Board of Supervisors, plus the Chief Administrative Officer, will provide a notarized statement to, the, to the Virginia when they send their annual report in that everyone on their governing body has been presented the audit report that they have to re send. You. Great. We're going to have to leave it at that. Okay. Thank you for being here, Delegate Charles Poindexter. It's been good to be with you today, Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia, Cal Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm-hmm.